Well, welcome back. We'll go ahead and get started here, find a seat. As you're being seated, just uh, a few little announcements for us here, uh, things we wanted to make you aware of. Uh, I know it's weird to start talking about uh, shuttle service already uh, on Tuesday morning, uh, talking about how you're going to get back to the airport, but um, if you could help us, if you need a ride back home from the conference tomorrow, if you could go to the info desk uh, before tonight and just sign up for a spot, that lets us know how many shuttles we need. So I'd like to ask you guys to do that for us. Um, and then secondly, um, if you haven't been with us before, one of our patterns here at the conference is that on Tuesday morning, uh, we have the, the main session speakers do a question and answer. Um, so Rico and Andy and Alistair will all be up here. So if you have a question as you've been listening to these main sessions that you would like to ask any one of them or all three of them, uh, you can submit that question. We've been having a, a little bit of trouble with our uh, email system, so uh, we're going to go old school. So you can just go to the info desk and write it on a piece of paper over there, and then we'll get it to the proper person uh, for consideration. So. Well, in just a moment, we're going to sing, and then Rico, uh, have a chance to hear from Rico again. But before we do that, let's just uh, quiet our hearts in prayer. So please pray with me. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of sitting underneath your word together. We thank you that you are a speaking God, that you haven't left us to wonder what your desires are, but you have spoken to us clearly. And we thank you uh, for the men who have already opened the scripture for us to reveal uh, your son Jesus, to reveal our sin, quite honestly, but also to reveal uh, your son Jesus. Uh, so Lord, even as we enter into this next session, uh, we pray that uh, you would fix our minds and our hearts on Jesus and prepare our, our minds again uh, to, to learn and hear from you. And we pray that in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night. Waking Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father and I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling and I with thee. Riches I need not, nor man's empty praise. Thou
Let's remain standing to pray. Our Father God, please speak to us this morning, we pray. We ask this for our sake, for the sake of those back in our home churches, but above all, for the glory of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we're thinking about the pastor as a disciple and as disciple maker. And uh, just to say that um, I hope you were struck yesterday by Billy Graham and the way that Joshua 7 was in his veins. And I think the way that people spoke of his personal godliness, you can see how that passage had made its way into his life. And uh, I particularly wanted to leave you with this little uh, uh, diagram here. I find it such a help in discipling people. What are you thinking? Get the word of God into your head first thing in the morning. What are you feeling? You know, we only live in one of two areas. I find I either live in resentment or thanksgiving. And as a pastor, as a a church worker, uh, as an elder, the antennae is always out for resentment because resentment leads to rebellion. So I'm looking for that. I'm always trying to find that. There was a guy called David Fletcher who was a minister back in England, and I walked in when I was at theological college to his church. He was about 65. I was a young theological student. I walked in, and I was grumpy that day, and he looked at me, and he said, oh, Rico, 
are you still going to heaven? I said, yeah. He said, that's all right. I thought something was wrong. <laughs> but you know, we've got to get it in place. I was cross at the time, but it stayed with me. Now, now particularly as, as we think about that, thinking, feelings, we, we've got to acknowledge those feelings. The British hate them, but they're there. And if we don't get them into control, we're all over the place. Choices, behaving, what choices am I making? Lust, anger, whatever. Go through the verses, put sin to death, mortify the flesh with the word of God and the spirit. Physical health, we've got to watch that. It's really important. I was speaking to a guy this morning, he's been up through the night with his baby. Well, you know, what impact does that have on the day as different things hit the environment? And particularly, I just wanted to think about the words that I find myself... Um, oh, no, sorry, that's not the... Ro- sorry, um, the... That's, the, that, that's a good slide, but not the one I wanted. The words that I, um, that, that I find myself uh, uh, thinking about each morning. How does God feel about me? He's delighted with me. When was I converted before the beginning of time? What sort of day is today? Today's a great day because today's the God has planned. If it's good for God, it's good for me. It may not be for my, happy, for my happiness, but it's for my holiness. And if it makes me holy, I'm happy. And then the one I finished with, I want to focus on this a bit um, uh, 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 as we come to today. Why is today a better day than yesterday? And today's a better day than yesterday because I'm a day closer to seeing Christ. But the other side of that, and I'm an evangelist in a church family trying to mobilize the church family for evangelism. The other side of it is, why is it a worse day for the non-Christian? And it's a worse day because they're a day closer to hell. So I want to speak on that subject today. And I want to, um, uh, with all humility and trying to get the right tone, speak about that area. And, uh, and, and almost sort of try and do a, a little model sermon. So this, this isn't really for you, but this is to take back to your churches. And again, I've not found Anglicans that have mentored me in this. Sinclair Ferguson has been such a help thinking this thing through. Of course, I remember the first time I read Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and I remember sweating as I did this. So, so this is a sort of, you know, how do, we, how do we try and speak on this subject? I'm not saying I've got it right here, but this is, I hope you can jot the headings down, take them back to your home church, and be, and be looking to, to, to preach it and teach on it. So let's uh, move forward, and uh, let's, let's hit this uh, uh, talk now. So as, as we come to it, can we turn please to Mark and chapter 9. Mark 9, as we're trying to think through the reality of speaking on hell. So Mark 9 and verse 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than have two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire." Salt is good, but if the salt lose, has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Now, brothers, as I'm seeking to then start this sermon, obviously, do jot this down at the top of your notes. You know this, but tone is absolutely critical. Tone. And so I'm thinking two things as I speak. One is I'm thinking I'm for you. I'm for you. And the second thing I'm thinking as I, as I preach this is, I believe in the Holy Spirit, because this is against, certainly in England, what people have been taught to believe for decades. So I'm for you. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Tone is critical. Uh, Then I'll say a little prayer, something like, um, uh, uh, Father God, you know, in some ways I don't really want to preach this sermon, and it will be hard to hear. Please send your Spirit to enable each one of us to hear this and to be able to work out what is true. So that's what I'll do. And then I'll start. So here's, here's the sermon. So again, not so much for you, but one to be taken home and preached uh, in your home congregations or taught in your study groups. Um, so this is it. I'd like to begin with um, a, a, a little quiz this evening. So here's a Cleveland quid, quiz. So please sharpen your pencils. And I'm going to give four names, and then I'm going to read two quotations. And I'd like you to identify the author of the quote. So here are the names. Pharaoh the Emperor Nero, Mohammed, and Adolf Hitler. And the question is, which of these men said the following? Question one, throw these worthless servants into the darkness. They can weep there and grind their teeth. Question two, get out of my presence, you damned, and go to the fire that will burn forever. 
Well, of course, it's a trick question because the answer is none of the above. The person who said both those things is the Lord Jesus Christ. And on both those occasions, he was speaking about hell, as indeed he is in the passage that we've looked at this morning. He's being unequivocal with us, absolutely clear. So again, can I draw you back to the passage? Do you, do you remember what it said? Verse 43, and if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And it's to the subject of hell we come this morning. And contrary uh, to uh, what I suppose is much popular opinion, I've no idea around here, but certainly in England, um, uh, 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 we're not always speaking about hell. The truth of the matter is that the subject is scarcely raised today within the church. Uh, it's very infrequently preached in our pulpits, but this is what Jim Packer said in his classic, Knowing God. He wrote this, How often in the past year did you hear... Or if you are a minister, did you preach a sermon on this subject? When did you last hear it? When did you last preach it? And I heard this on good authority from a minister I totally trust, and he said this to me. A member of the royal family was leaving one of the great centres of worship of England and said to the presiding minister, a figure of some significance in the hierarchy of the church, is it true there is a hell? And the minister replied, Your Highness, Jesus taught so, the church has always believed so, and the creeds teach us so. And the reply he got was this, Then why in the name of God will you not say so? Uh, so um, uh, I wrote this little book, Honest Evangelism. It sold very well. I've managed to sell eight copies. It's been outstanding. And... Um, <laughs> My wife says honest and Rico ties shouldn't be on the same page. And in fact, it was quite funny as we were, as we were writing it. Um, I've got dyslexia. I can't, you know, I can't really write. And um, so I had sort of some sermon bits. But I was meant to write it during a sabbatical, during the Soccer World Cup five, six years ago in Brazil. But of course, that torpedoed the book writing. And, um, and, uh, and so at half term... Uh, just before the deadline with the publishers, my wife and I had to get together because she's an English major and so she could really write. So we spent five days writing this with her parents looking after our kids over this half-term holiday. And after five days, I said, I said to my wife, Lucy, I said, darling, isn't this lovely? Here we are working together on this book for the gospel. And she looked at me and she said, I hate you and I hate this book. <laughs> so um, I dedicated it to her. Do get a copy. And... Um, pick it up. And I don't know how your wife feels about your ministry, but that's sometimes where we are. Now, in the, in the book here, in the book here, I talk about the pain line. And I say there is always a pain line to cross when we're talking individually and indeed from the pulpit. It's why tone is so important, because we're going to say some hard things. So there is a pain line to cross here. And there's no pain line almost bigger than the word hell, personally, or from the pulpit. So the word itself can scarcely be named in public worship without there being a sharp intake of breath. It's not a happy subject, it's a profoundly serious subject, and it's not a subject of polite conversation. In fact, I know of no subject where, which is less appreciated, I've found, than when this come up. I have been asked to leave dinner parties over this word, literally said, would you leave, please? Indeed, there is, in fact, only one context in which the word may be used without feathers being ruffled, and that's when it's either used as a curse or a joke. We seek him here, we seek him there. Those Frenchies seek him everywhere. Is he in heaven? Is he in hell? That damned elusive pimpernel. Now, trivialization like that will work. But hell is a word that is used in the Bible, and hell is a subject that runs right through the Bible. And you cannot... You cannot fully appreciate the coming of Jesus Christ without grasping what the Bible says about hell. Can I say that again? You cannot fully appreciate the coming of Jesus without grasping this. Right at the heart of the gospel is being saved from hell through the cross for heaven. And so just as in a great painting, it's often the dark backcloth which makes the foreground appear so luminous and shine with such clarity, so there is a sense in which it's only as we plummet the dark depths about human destiny that the wonder of God's love and grace appears in its amazing 
amazing glory. We only then see it as it really is. So on the Christian Explore course, we say to people from weeks two to seven, you're not good people going to heaven, you're sinners going to hell. And we know that, as Billy Graham said, in evangelism, it's not getting people saved that's the issue, it's getting them lost. Getting them lost. So again and again, we're doing sin, judgment, cross the pain line, wrath, hell. We have to do it again and again. I'm for you, get the tone right, but we've got to do it. In order that people can work out that life's greatest happiness is to be convinced we're loved, Victor Hugo, as they see what they're saved from. So as Keller time and again says, you know, we're more wicked than we ever imagined and more loved than we ever dreamed. And the gospel does that as we, as, as we see the wonder of salvation set against the dark depths of our own need and sinfulness. And we can't fully appreciate what it means to be raised up to the promise of heaven until we realize that we're raised up from the prospect of hell. Now, again, I personally come from a non-Christian family, so I speak of this subject with such sadness and weariness. I, I speak coming from a family in which so many of my relations conduct their lives convinced that these solemn truths are untrue or, if true, are somehow irrelevant because they've lived such good lives. That's what they think. We've lived a good life. God will accept us because of that. So we don't need this. It's desperate. And so I want to try and uh, ask and answer some crucial questions around the subject of hell and explain why it's so vitally important for us as Christians, and uh, 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 especially, actually, if we're not Christians. In fact, can I say, if you're not a Christian here this morning, then this is the most important 20 minutes of your life as I speak now, if this is true, unequivocally. So I want to ask, and here's the, the, the first question I want to put up, here it is, I want to ask this, uh, does hell really exist? Paul the Apostle tells us in 2 Timothy 1 verse 11 that of the appearing of our Saviour Jesus Christ who's destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And so he's about to be executed in the Mamma time and he cries out just before he's to be executed, Jesus Christ has destroyed death. In other words, by his death, on Good Friday and resurrection on Easter Day, Jesus has secured for us eternal life. So he got through death himself, he can get me through. And the proper epitaph for the Christian is not RIP, rest in peace, but CAD, Christ abolished death. And you see, here's the issue. Jesus lived and taught, he had a group of followers, he was tried in a Roman and Jewish court, he was sentenced to die, they strung him up on a cross, they put a spear through his side, they took him off the cross, they certified him as dead, they put him in a tomb, and three days later he was walking around again. Now if he got through death himself, he can get me through. And that's why he's got authority here, and that resurrection is checkable. We have historical roots. So I go to this teaching of hell from there. And it's an amazing hope. It's the most glorious hope. So I've got a funeral card here of a, a friend of mine, and I, at his funeral, I wanted to speak about, about the wonder and the hope we've got, but I can't speak of that without speaking about this too. It's an integrity issue. You can't keep going on about Christian hope without also talking about this side. So we're called to not just give hope, but to warn. Now, I find that hard to do at funerals. I say there is a warning but I make sure I try and do it at other times to have integrity. Do you know, um, the first funeral I took of a, of a young guy was a 30-year-old called Stuart Spencer, and he died of leukemia. He asked me to speak at his funeral, and I went to see him three days before he died. And I went in, and I was sort of 27 and didn't know what I was doing. So I asked him a lovely pastoral question. I looked at him and I said, Stuart, what's it like to die? Great, isn't it? Don't you think it's lovely? Pastorally so sensitive. And he looked at me thinking, I can't believe I've got this Muppet speaking at my funeral. <laughs> but I'll never forget what he said. Had a PhD, this guy, age 30. He looked at me and he said, Rico, Christ has risen. I said, Stuart, what's it like to die? Rico, Christ has risen. Quick as a flash. That past certainty gives me a future hope. But it also causes me, as we come to this moment, to, to, to go to the Lord Jesus and say to him, what do you have to say about life and death? because you rose from the dead. And he not only makes heaven and the new creation clear, but assuredly he supremely in the pages of the New Testament, he is the one who is clear about the reality of hell. As the risen Christ, he's the authority on this. So let me be categorical about this. The person who most fully teaches about hell is Jesus Christ. 
Now, at this point, what I like to do is just turn people to Matthew's gospel and let them look at Jesus and what he said. And what I tend to say to them is this. I say, are you familiar with this man and what he has said? Let's have a look together. And whoever says, you fool, Matthew 5.22, will be liable to the hell of fire. On we go. Matthew 5.29, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away, for it's better that you lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Matthew 7, verse 13, enter by the get narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it by it are many. And it goes on. Matthew 8, verse, uh, 8, 8, verse 12, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness, in that place there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 10, 28, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 13, verse 42, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And this is the only Jesus there is. There is only one Jesus, my dear brothers, and this is what he says. There is only one Jesus, and this is what he says. So what do you make of him? Do you know, if this isn't Jesus, we don't know who Jesus is. We have no idea who he is if this isn't the Jesus that we come to. Are you familiar with this man? So please see that this theme of judgment leading to condemnation, leading to conditions that are variously described as weeping, lostness, gnashing of teeth, or flames of fire, is most clearly stated in the teaching of Jesus. And of course, this is the case because he's the one who comes to save us from this. I mean, these warnings that he issues, this vivid language, why does he, loving Jesus, passionate Jesus, caring Jesus, life-transforming Jesus, the one who in the Sermon on the Mount said, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, then as he was up on the cross, cried out, Father, forgive them of the people killing him, why does he, the most loving man that ever lived, say this? Why will he not keep silent? Because this is the very reason he came. It's why he came. Because unless he comes to die, the destiny that awaits men and women is beyond thinking. It is beyond bearing. When my grandmother died, uh, my brother and I were the only two Christians in the family. And um, he gave a reading, Psalm 121, and she died saying, because I'm a good person, God will, God will accept me. Now I leave her in God's hands. It's for him to judge. But I don't have hope of seeing her. But I leave her with him. He, he judges. But halfway through the reading, my brother burst into tears. I was the only one who knew why in that church. And, uh, and, 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 and there is only one Jesus. He speaks of this. And this is a hard thing. So when I first got ordained, I was uh, asked by Richard Buse, my boss at All Souls, to speak on, you know, that the sermon uh, subject comes up. And he put me down for these verses. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9. He'll punish those who don't know God and don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they'll be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord from the glory of his might. I had hoped he might preach on it, but he left me to do it. Anyway, there we are. So I, I preached the sermon and, and at, at the end of it, after, after I've preached it, there's a man who is um, a, a, an American man and he'd, he'd uh, come over to London three weeks after his wife uh, had died and they'd been married for 40 years they'd never gone to church and for the first time in, four, in 40 years he came to church to find comfort and I preached this sermon <laughs> and then and then he wrote me this letter so I'm just ordained one year and he wrote me this letter I can't imagine a just kind and loving God inflicting pain upon my wife that is the sort of niggardly cramped view that something inside me tells me is wrong I think you're really preaching your own bizarre views when you say that those who don't believe in Christ and don't follow the gospel are going to hell. Why you have such views is another matter, but particularly where your views have such a horrendous effect upon others, I think you should carefully consider whether to speak in such a manner. In December 1984, there was a huge uh, crash uh, uh, following a fog on the M25 motorway, and early in the morning, a lorry... Uh, 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 carrying paper crashed in the fog and all the warning lights came on there were hazard signs the police were there but here was the issue uh, in that crash and there were over 20 people killed because of it 
Um, driver after driver driving along the M4 trying to get to work ignored the warning lights, ignored the hazard signs and the fog and drove on. And the policemen, realizing what was happening, became possessed with fear as they could see the destruction that was happening. And they actually started to pick up traffic cones and throw them at the windscreens to stop people and people wouldn't stop. They kept driving. And there was one newspaper report that said this. Um, one of the policemen had tears running down his face as he threw cones at the drivers who would pay no attention. And brothers, the Lord Jesus is throwing cones at our windscreen here. That's what he's doing. He's throwing cones. And, 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 and he's doing that. And, and, and he is the one that tells us this is a place uh, called hell. Secondly, the second question, let's come to the next question. Here it is. So what then is hell like? What's it like? So is there a place called hell? Yes, Jesus says so. Take it home, preach it, please teach it. Secondly, what is it like? Now, this may be something that many of us as Christians are likely to say, well, it's something about which the Bible speaks so little that anything I said would be speculative, when the truth of the matter is, that, uh, uh, is the reverse. The Bible has yards of na of, uh, on the nature of hell. Granted, the Bible understands that the reality of hell is so terrible that it must in its very nature go beyond the power of human language to either explain or, or, or describe it, but it, it does have several important things to say about the nature of hell. And the first is this. Unequivocally, it says that it is a sphere of punishment. It's a sphere of punishment. Jesus' teaching underscores this, that there is a, a just a judgment of God, which men who are separated from his presence, that's what's happened, and there's a penal judgment for their rejection of God's authority and their rejection of Jesus Christ. So the kind of language Jesus uses is the language of punishment. Can we have a look down and see in the text that I read, can we see that together? Verse 48, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. It's the language of punishment. Secondly, what are we told about it? Well, we're told, secondly, that, that it's, um, it's a, a, a place of separation. Sorry, here we go, a place of separation. So it's outer darkness. You know, living in London, you never see this, but go to the highlands of Scotland or to the Lake District, and I'm sure many parts of America here, uh, uh, on, and on a, on a cloudy night, such as the, the darkness, that you can, you know this, you can put your hand right in front of your face and see absolutely nothing up in the highlands of Scotland or the lakes. You can see nothing. You have your hand there. And Jesus says, there, will be, there, there you will be totally isolated, alone, disorientated, and above all, separated from all the relationships that have given you your identity, your value, your sense of function. So this is a place of total separation. And perhaps the most solemn thing of all is the way our Lord Jesus uses the word everlasting. You see, disorientation we can take for a moment, punishment we can endure for a season, separation we could cope with if we knew it would end. But the horror of this situation is the way in which it's described as being everlasting. So let's see that in the words of Jesus. Extraordinary, isn't it? Do you see these words? And these will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. And the word used for both is ionos. So I know that there are people who are annihilationists, and I, I know them, and I'm not going to separate from them over this, but can I say I do not see it in the words of Jesus. It is eternal. Eternal. It's a terrible thing. And what does this say to us? It says this to us, God takes your life with infinite seriousness and he takes your relationship to him with infinite seriousness and on this occasion when I say infinite I mean infinite he takes you infinitely seriously and if we reject that relationship then we reject him who is life and the source of life and in a strange way he dignifies us by saying I'll take your decision about your relationship with me with permanent seriousness so is hell real? Yes, Jesus says so. It's the only Jesus we know. What is it like? It's a place of suffering. Thirdly, who is it for? So the third question for your notes, who is hell for? And again, if we go back to Mark's gospel, let's see 
who it's for, verse 43. And if your hand calls you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot calls you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye calls you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes be thrown into hell. So hell is for those people, brothers, who say, listen, Nobody tells me what I do with my hands. I'm independent. I do my thing. Nobody tells me what I do with my feet. They're mine. I go where I like. No one tells me what I do with my eyes. Nobody. And the Bible responds, no, God made those eyes, and he made those hands, and he made those feet, And what you do with them is in your creator's jurisdiction. How I treat my hands, my eyes, and my feet. So it was John Stott who said, the road to destruction is defined by two things, tolerance and permissiveness. Tolerance, I can think as I please. Don't you judge me. How dare you judge me? I can think of as I please, tolerance. It's used as a stick to beat us with. Permissiveness, I can do as I please. So no one can tell me what I think uh, and what I do. It's up to me. And the Bible says, no, it's your creator's business. And so therefore, who is God for? Who, Who is hell for? Do we see as we look down? It's for those who live as they please. That's who it's for. It's for those who will not have God as their God. At the heart of sin is saying, and I reject his son Jesus Christ and what he's done for me. And for those who will not take sin and its consequences seriously. So as an evangelist, I spend my life trying to persuade people of the seriousness of sin. And I think that was again where Billy Graham was so extraordinary with Joshua 7. He was so serious about sin. So, is hell for real? Yes, Jesus said so. What is it like? It is a place of punishment, separation, darkness, and fire. Who is it for? It is for those who will not change, who will not submit to their creator. They won't do it. And then lastly, as we come to a close, how can I escape if it is at all possible? Please make sure you write down this last question. Well, the good news is that it's possible to escape, but in order to escape, you have to have some sense of why it is so important that you should escape. You have to have, see the seriousness of it. Of verse 48, the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. I've got to see that. Now, uh, 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 it's a tough illustration, this, but, but we're being very serious. So here is the illustration. Uh, like all of you, I'll never forget the Twin Towers in flames at, at the south end of Manhattan, and some here will have close friends who were there and died that day, so my heart goes out to you. And seeing those almost unimaginable pictures of horror of people who were experiencing what they were experiencing up on the top floors of those great buildings, and actually, do you remember the horror of it? They were joining hands and leaping, leaping for anything would be better than this fire in the building. Absolutely haunting. And if we can see the danger of sin and the fire that is to come, how can we escape? And the reason Jesus came into the world was to bear the hell we deserve. Do you, do, you want to, do you want to communicate how much he loves you? Well, he came into the world to bear the hell that we deserve. He came in order that we might be saved from the awful destiny and rescued for the new creation. Uh, and there's no other explanation, no other reason for that terrible cry on the afternoon of the crucifixion. My God, this is out of darkness. Why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you see what was happening? He was entering into death as the judgment of God against my sin, against what my hands, my feet have done in his world, against the way that I have utterly mistreated God's son who came to rescue me. 
and all God's anger is placed on him. So Jesus cries out, why have I been forsaken by you, God? And if there is anything that would persuade you that the judgment of God is an awful thing to undergo, then go to Calvary and hear him cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is how serious our sin is, that Christ has to die. That's why uniquely the Christian faith can bring you to God, because no other religion takes sin so seriously. The Lord Jesus has to pay in death and blood for my sin. And as Jesus experiences the essence of hell, the outer darkness, the weeping and the gnashing of teeth, but there in the depths of the cry, piercing the afternoon darkness, he provides the rescue from your plight and he opens the door to heaven. So as he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, it's so that through Christ you can gasp, my God, my God, why have I been accepted? Why have I been accepted? How have you possibly done this, Lord? After what these have done, and after what my eyes have done, and my hands have done, and my, my feet have done. It is an overwhelming thing. And brothers, if it's not, you see, it's because we don't see the seriousness of our sin. If this isn't overwhelming, it's because we can't see our sin. Do you see that Jesus has so loved us that he's been prepared to enter our world, but not just go that, do that, go to the very depths and humble himself, even unto death. He's been prepared to do that. So there is only one way that you get to hell. There's only one way to hell. Please jot this down. The one way you get to hell is this. You have to trample over the cross of Jesus. So Jesus blocks the way. He says, you're not going. I've paid in death and blood. He says, don't go. I'm blocking the way. But if you want to go to hell, you have to trample over the cross. So do you know, 100 years ago, preachers would frequently finish their sermons with this question. They'd frequently finish it with this. Here's the question they'd finish with. Where will you spend eternity? And by God's grace, may there be no doubt what your answer would be to that question. Where will you spend it? Let's pray. Now, just in case there is one person in this room who's not yet Christian, if there is one then here is a prayer for you. So I'm going to say it once and you can echo it in your own heart and there are, there are many people in this room but we're going to wait for you to pray this prayer because this is so important for you and I'm on my knees and I'm pleading with you to come to the Lord Jesus and to ask him to pay for your sin rather than you go to hell yourself. So here's the prayer. Lord Jesus... I'm so sorry for what my hands, feet, eyes have done in your world. Please forgive me. Thank you so much for bearing all my sin on the cross. Please send your spirit to help me turn away from everything in my life, which the Bible says is wrong, and follow you. So that's the prayer. I'm going to say it, to say it phrase by phrase now, and it's for you. If you haven't yet asked Christ to forgive you. Lord Jesus Christ, just echo it in your own heart. I'm sorry for what my hands, feet, and eyes have done in your world. Please forgive me. Thank you so much for bearing all my sin on the cross. Please send your spirit to help me turn away from everything in my life which the Bible says is wrong and follow you. Amen. I just want to take one minute, two minutes. <laughs> Brothers, I just want to take two minutes just as we close now. So that's the sermon I preach. But just on a personal level, how do I train people? How do I train people to say this? So, you know, here we are. We've, we've, we've had this talk. But, you know, you, you believe it. But you say, how do I raise this? How do I say it? So I just want to tell you what I do with people. What I do is when I visit non-Christians and I, I chat with them, I get out a cigarette packet. I get it out. And um, uh, I, 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 I throw it across and I, I say, I don't know, would you like one? And then they sort of stop and they look at me a bit. And I, I say, look, I say, look, um, uh, if I got out a, 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 a cigarette to smoke, I said, I, I, I'd, I'd expect you to warn me 
And, and I'd expect you even just to say, you know, you know, on the packet here, smoking kills, smoking causes lung cancer, just to see that. By the way, I just want to stop here and say I'd like to thank Alistair for lending me this packet. I'll be getting it back to him straight afterwards. Thanks, Alistair. Brother, I know... Brother, I know that you'll be desperate to get out to the car park in 10 minutes, so I'll get this back to you. I know that with a couple of your apprentices. Anyway, thank you. But I... What I... What I, what I then do is I say, I say, mate, there's a warning on the packet. And I say, if you were my friend, I'd hope you'd say, Rico, you can make that choice, but there's a warning on the packet. Nine out of 10 people die. So I, I, I get the cigarette packets out. I hope you can all in future be carry, carrying cigarette packets. <laughs> okay, that's what I do. And then I do three verses. I say, I just want to show you a warning, and I'm not your mate, because I think there's a radioactive warning in scripture. And please let me do it, because I think it's, it's actually far more vivid than this one and it's terminal, it's eternal, so will you let me do it? This, and then I say, I say, this friendship's important to me, so I don't want it to break that, but I'm not your friend unless I say this. So I cross the pain line as I do that. I've celebrated them, I get to know them, I ask questions, I serve them, but I cross the pain line by getting out a cigarette packet. Okay, and then I do three passages. The first one I do is Psalm 103. I say, look, I came to faith through this passage, just a few verses. As for man, his days are like grass, he flourishes like a flower of the field, the wind blows its place and is it no more. And I say, we can flourish, but it's over so quickly. I've buried nine of my school friends. So you're flourishing, it's great, but it's over so quickly. And as an Anglican clergyman, I, over the graveside, I, I, I say these words, and then I say wonderfully, but from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. I'm saying, I think it's possible that there's hope in the face of death. And I, I want to tell you that. The second thing, interestingly, I say is, here's, I say, here's another verse. And I say, I got converted through that verse. But my dad in his 70s got converted through this one, Deuteronomy uh, 8, verses 17 and 18. You may say, my power and the strength of my hands have created this wealth for me, but remember the Lord your God, it's he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So the second one I do with him is I say, look, there's another warning here, which is that everything you have is a gift. When you pick up your daughter and you cuddle her, she's a gift. She's not just a piece of meat, a piece of DNA. It's all a gift, and, and your ability in business that actually makes you such an alpha male, I think that's a gift too. Crossing the pain line here. By the way, this is bad for your health as you do it. But then I do this. This is the third thing. I then say, do you know, people talk about the Sermon on the Mount loads. I just want to look at it with you. And I'm not your friend unless I do it, but there's a warning here. Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And I walk them through what it says the wide and narrow way. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. There are many who enter it, for the gate is narrow and the, and the way is hard that leads to life, and, and few find it. And I say, look, I'm, I've got to give you those verses. I hope your question would be with a cigarette packet, what's the evidence? Can we chat about the evidence? And then the other thing I've got is, 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 is I have this in my bag, I carry it constantly as well, is I say, but we're told about a gate here. And then I, I get out, it's that meeting with people individually, I just got my magnifying glass. I said, I was a little boy, I grew up in Africa. And as a little boy in Africa, I had two hobbies, stamp collecting and butterflies. There was no kids TV. And for both of them, you needed one of these, a magnifying glass. And then I say this, I soon found though that taking this into the African sun was marvelous. It couldn't just make little things bigger. As a five-year-old in the African sun, the possibilities were endless. You could set a, you could set a light, a, 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 a leaf, or, or a piece of newspaper, or even the gardener's hut. I said, best of all, if you held your twin sister down, you could scare the living daylights out of her with one of these. That was before I thought of ordination into the Anglican church. You see, you can take a magnifying glass and focus the rays of the sun into such a sharp point of intensity, it burns things. Well, imagine a massive moral magnifying glass the size of this room, and through it are past not the sun's rays, but God's righteous anger at the selfishness, the gossip, the hatred, the lust, the godlessness in my heart. I'm not even talking about yours, in mine. And I think what then happened was God reflected all this down, down, down until it hit one man at one point in history so that he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I say, listen, I'm not your friend unless I say that. What do you make of that warning? What do you make of it? There's a warning on the packet here. There's a warning here. And I don't want to take your funeral unless you've got that. So I, I use the cigarette packets all the time to, to, to do this. So can I ask you, get yourself a magnifying glass, get yourself a cigarette packet, 
pull one out of a trash can. When I meet you in future years, shake my hand and say, I've got my cigarettes on me. But, but it's very tough in the culture to cross the pain line and get to it, and that's how I get to it. That's how I get to it. I pray, and, um, and, I, and, I, and I say that. And I say, look, let's just look at the evidence. But I'm not your friend if I don't give you the warning, and you wouldn't be mine if you didn't say, Rike, you've got kids, stop it. You shouldn't be doing it. But for the love of God and love of people, brothers, we've got to cross this pain line. We've got to do it, and we must model it. We must model it. At the heart of the Christian faith is being saved from hell through the cross for heaven. Great, let's have some music, and I'll give these back to Alistair. <laughs> you stand with us, let's see. When I fear my faith will fail Christ will hold me fast When the tempter would prevail He will hold me fast I could never keep my hope Through life's fearful path For my love is often cold He must hold me Justice has been satisfied. 